Almost all of the nuclear power we use on Earth today uses water as a basic coolant. At normal pressures, water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. This isn't nearly hot enough to generate electricity effectively. So water-cooled reactors have to run at much higher pressures than atmospheric pressure. And this means that you have to build a water-cooled reactor as a pressure vessel. If that sounds heavy, that's because it is. We were looking at a nuclear reactor and they tend to be heavy and you need to have a large amount of shielding. My dad worked on the SNAP reactor for NASA. Did he really? Yeah. And what my dad did was he shook the shit out of it and then they would see what broke and then they would nice. fix it, shake it again, see what broke, shake it, and then they ran it for a thousand hours and then up powered, down powered, they were gonna put it in a Saturn V rocket, yep, exactly. send it to the moon, they never did that, send it to the space base that they never built, put it onto Mars and they never did that program. It's a shame. We presented this at the Nuclear and Emerging Technologies for Space uh, conference to accommodate uh, space travel or off-world living. That brings in a whole set of more robust variables that need to be attended to. Nuclear reactors in space, like you just said, they are under such extreme conditions. <laughs> you know, the, the, the shuttering of the rocket as it's going up into space. I mean, there's G-forces, the vibrational problems. But NASA is everything in space, and so if you can have a much lighter reactor, let's do it. Well, your choices are limited. You're not going to make a, a light water reactor that's, you know, you need this really thick pressure vessel. Let me diss on water a few more times. <laughs> it's a covalently bonded substance. The oxygen has a covalent bond with two hydrogens. Well, neither one of those bonds is strong enough to survive getting smacked around by a gamma or a neutron. And sure enough, they knock the hydrogens clean off. Now, in a water-cooled reactor, you have a system called a recombiner that will take the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas that is always being created from the nuclear reaction and put them back together. It's a great system as long as it's operating and the, and the system is pumping. Well, at Fukushima Daiichi, the problem was is the pumping power stopped. At high temperature, H2O can also react with the cladding to release hydrogen or damage the cladding releasing radioactive isotopes. These two accidents illustrate the need for a coolant which is more chemically stable than H2O. In a community on the moon, we would live very, very close to your power source. This isn't something that's going to be far away. And if the power source were to fail, you're going to die really quickly. So I thought if I was on the moon and I was totally dependent on a power source, I'd want one that I would just about feel comfortable living right on top of. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima were all radically different incidents. But what all three had in common was how poorly water performed as a coolant when things started to go wrong. Steam takes up about a thousand times more volume than liquid water. If you have liquid water at 300 degrees Celsius and suddenly you depressurize it, it doesn't stay liquid for very long. It flashes into steam. That's a scuba tank, hot scuba tank, full of nuclear material. At Three Mile Island, water couldn't be pumped into the core because some of the coolant water had vaporized into steam. The increased pressure forced coolant water back out, contributing to a partial meltdown. At Chernobyl, the insertion of poorly designed control rods caused core temperature to skyrocket. The boiling point of the pressurized water coolant was passed and it flashed to steam. It was a steam explosion that tore the 2,000-ton lid off the reactor casing and shot it up through the roof of the building. At Fukushima, loss of pump power allowed coolant water to get hotter and hotter until it boiled away. These three accidents illustrate the need for a coolant with a higher boiling point than water. When you put water under extreme pressure, like anything else, it wants to get out of that extreme pressure. Almost all of the aspects of our nuclear reactors today that we find the most challenging can be traced back to the need to have pressurized water. Water-cooled reactors have another additional challenge. They need to be near large bodies of water where the steam they generate can be cooled and condensed. Otherwise, they can't generate electrical power. Now, there's no lakes or rivers on the moon. So if all of this makes it sound like water-cooled reactors aren't such a good fit for a lunar community, I would tend to agree with you. You see, I had the good fortune to learn about a different form of nuclear power that doesn't have all these problems for a very simple reason. It's not based on water cooling and it doesn't use solid fuel. Surprisingly, it's based on salt. 
Science allows you to look at, at everyday objects for what they really are, chemically and physically. And it really makes you look twice at the world around you. Your table salt is frozen. That's a really strange thing to think about. Your table salt on your kitchen table is it's frozen. But once they melt, they have a thousand degrees C of liquid range. And they have excellent heat transfer properties. They can carry a lot of heat per unit volume, just like water. Water actually is really good from a heat transfer perspective. It's good at carrying heat per unit volume. Salts are just as good at carrying heat per unit volume, but salts don't have to be pressurized. And that, if you remember nothing else of what I say tonight, remember that one fact. A nuclear reactor is a rough place for normal matter. The nice thing about a salt is it's formed from a positive ion and a negative ion, like sodium's positively charged and chlorine's negatively charged, and they go, we're not really gonna bond, we're just gonna kind of associate one with another, you know? And that's what's called an ionic bond. Yeah, you're kind of friends, you know, you're... Facebook friends. Facebook, yeah, Facebook <laughs> friends. All right, well, it turns out this is a really good thing for a reactor because a reactor is going to take those guys and just smack them all over the place with gammas and neutrons and everything. And the good news is, is they don't really care who they particularly are next to. As long as there's an equal number of positive ions and negative ions, the big picture is happy. A salt is composed of the stuff that's in this column, the halogens, and the stuff that's in the, these columns, the alkalis and the alkaline earths. Fluorine is so reactive with everything, but once it's made a salt, a fluoride, then it's incredibly chemically stable and non-reactive. Sodium chloride, table salt, or potassium iodide, they have really high melting points, and we like the lower melting points of fluoride salts. Sometimes people go, oh, you're working on liquid fluorine reactors. No, I am not working on liquid fluorine reactors. We're living with fluoride reactors, and there's a big difference between those two. One is going to explode. The other one is, like, super duper stable. I see moving to molten salt fueled reactor technology as a way to get rid of all the stored energy term problems that we look at in today's reactors, whether it's pressure, whether it's chemical reactivity, even the potential of fission products in the fuel itself to be released those fission products are bound up very tightly in salts. Strontium and cesium are both bound up in very, very stable fluoride salts. Cesium fluoride, very stable salt. Uh, strontium bifluoride, another very stable salt. In light water reactors, cesium is volatile in the, in the chemical state of the uh, oxide fuel of a light water reactor. And that's been one of the concerns about cesium release. Cesium would not release from a, a fluoride reactor at all. I actually met Kirk at a, a conference in Manchester in the UK as part of an event put on by the Guardian newspaper. Hi, I'm Kirk Sorensen. They'd invited people to come and present their ideas and Kirk was one of the ten people that presented. And I can remember sitting on the panel and just being kind of blown away by the fact that, that there was an alternative version of nuclear. I'm an environmentalist. My passion is kind of climate change and energy. I worked at Friends of the Earth, who, you know, a green campaign group in the UK, and I was an anti-nuclear campaigner. But I've become a politician. Faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Her That's changed my life quite a lot, so I'm still getting used to it, really. People call me my lady and the Baroness. But Sellafield Limited is actively working with the 600 people who are going to be losing their jobs at this time, and everybody in the area is doing their very best to see if these people can find jobs very quickly. Sellafield is a unique site in the UK, and I believe it could become the home of world-leading research into the use of next-generation nuclear reactors. Mm. Such reactors, as well as being more efficient in their fuel use, generating no long-lasting waste, can be designed to burn up existing stockpiles of plutonium held at the Sellafield site. Despite greater acceptance of nuclear power, there remain concerns about nuclear waste. So, in light of this, is there more that the government can do to support R&D into new nuclear designs that will help to ensure we develop the safest and most efficient new reactors? Yeah. 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 The engineer looks at the world as hundreds of things that are, that are inefficient and, and should be more properly designed. So when you tell an engineer that something's like 20% more efficient, it's like, yeah. You tell them it's like 50% more efficient, it's like, oh my gosh. Now imagine when you tell them it's hundreds of times more efficient. It becomes absolutely irresistible. Making solid nuclear fuel is a complicated and expensive process. And we extract less than 1% of the energy from the nuclear fuel before it can no longer remain in the reactor. The solid fuel will begin to swell and crack, and you begin to get this central void. This is actually a, 
a gap in the fuel. When the fuel swells to a certain point, the clad can't hold it anymore. And when the clad can't hold it anymore, it's time to remove the fuel from the reactor. At this point, only a small amount of the energy has been consumed. Wigner didn't like solid fuel. He was a chemical engineer by training, and he thought, what process do we run chemically based on solids? We don't. Everything we do, we use as liquids or gases because we can mix them completely. You can take a liquid, you can fully mix it. You can take a gas, you can fully mix it. You can't take a solid and fully mix it unless you turn it into a liquid or a gas. I believe part of this came from Wigner's educational background. He was the only person, or almost the only person, who combined a great skill as a nuclear physicist with great skill as an engineer. Wigner, of course, was a chemical engineer yes. by training. He was the only one who had, who, who commanded both of those attributes. Mm -hmm. and so he was able to see both the engineering and physics aspects. He was a chemical engineer by training, and he knew that in chemical processes, the reactant streams are almost always liquids and gases. They're fluids. And in fluids, a completion of the various chemical reactions are possible. He looked at the nuclear problem and wondered if the same principle might not apply. And they began investigating some very, very radical nuclear reactors, totally different than the kind of stuff we have now. Wigner was not terribly successful in making converts in the nuclear community. But he did make one convert, this guy, Alvin Weinberg. He was his student during the Manhattan Project. And Weinberg got it. He got the big picture. We need liquid fuel. I see it. I see what we got to do. They were into small modular reactors before small modular reactors were cool. Small, liquid, poor, and then you have high efficiency. So there's a couple of things that jumped right out at us. The shielding weight became reasonable. All these great benefits, how do we know this can work? Quite simply, because, because we did it.